morning. Let everyone please stand with us. We'll get started with our worship this morning. Please uh, be with Dan today as he brings a word to us, and uh, please uh, just be with everybody in our travels today and throughout the rest of the week, and please be with us in all the decisions we make and in everything we do, that we may uh, glorify your name in everything we do. In your name, amen. He 
You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. For greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. You're the God in this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like God. still to be done in this city.
week we're going to take a little bit of a turn as we've gone through the first five weeks or, or whatever it is we've uh, we've looked at the impact of godly people in an ungodly culture we followed the life of Daniel and his friends in into Babylon as they've been drug away to Babylon and and we've seen that how they have influenced that that new world that they live in a world that goes against everything that they stand for everything that they represent and yet not only do they remain strong and, and live holy within that, that new anti-God culture, they, they affect that culture in, in a positive way. And last week we began to look at Daniel chapter 4 and uh, we saw that the impact that Daniel had on King Nebuchadnezzar and, and it appears uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had that, finally had that moment where he recognized who God was and, and much of the reason for that, much of the credit to that goes to to Daniel and his willingness, his ability um, to, um, to uh, love this man and demonstrate God's character to this man, the king of Babylon. And so this week we're going to continue, we're going to look at the second half of chapter 4, but we're going to look at it from a little different perspective. As we've gone through this and we've considered what it takes to live godly in an ungodly culture, 
Now we're going to look at the ungodly side of this culture. We're going to look at the character of King Nebuchadnezzar. And we're going to see that he had a great weakness, a great sin present in his life that, that was at the root of, of just about all of his problems. And God is finally going to deal with that sin. He's going to deal with it in a, in a, in a way that is best for King Nebuchadnezzar. And, and I would hope that this is going to be a, a valuable look at us too because it's not only important that we learn how to affect the culture that we live in, but we also need to understand that we're prone, we fall into the same kind of sins and, and problems that, that, that the, the king did. And we're going to look at his particular sin today. You know, next week, when we're, we're going to have a, a, the child dedication service, we're going, to have a, a, we're going to move away from this for just a week as we, we're going to have a, a message that is, uh, I think, appropriate and applicable to, to families and, and to all of us in, that, in, in reality. But, but th- for this week, we're going to look at the sin of pride. And, and pride is a, a, a dangerous and a difficult sin. And it is often overlooked. We don't think of it when we begin to evaluate the big ones, the sins that, boy, I don't want to fall into, I don't want to get involved in. We often overlook pride, but pride is one of the most deadly, dangerous sins that that there is. And we're going to see that example of that in the the life of King Nebuchadnezzar. But my hope is that as we look at this today and we we, we consider how does pride show up in our life and, and, uh, and how do we deal with that particular sin in our life, my hope is that as we consider the life of Nebuchadnezzar, we will uh, have a greater understanding, a greater appreciation for the danger of pride and the sin of pride. And, uh, and more importantly, how do we deal with that? How do we address it when it begins to, to creep into our, our own life as, as Christians? I want to preface our, our text for today. We're going to look at the second half of Daniel 4, but I want to preface it with this passage, and it comes from... Proverbs 16, verse 18, it says this, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Uh, A a passage that probably many of you have heard before, but a a great passage that the life of of Nebuchadnezzar illustrates. Nebuchadnezzar is a perfect illustration of the idea that pride goes before a fall. That pride will eventually lead to a fall, and we're going to see that with Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible has a lot to say about pride. Uh, the word pride or proud occurs, uh, depending which terminology you use, but about 110 times in Scripture the word appears, and it never appears in a positive way. It's always described in a, in a negative um, context, and so, and so it is. It is very present in our lives. We have a great tendency to, to be prideful about things. And, um, and I want us to look today at how, how treacherous it is. Why is pride so dangerous? Well, I think there's three reasons that, that come to mind of why it, it is deadly in, in our life. And the first is because it is, it's so insidious. It is not apparent. It is not obvious. And so it's easy to slide into it a little bit at a time. There's some sins that we know when we're doing it, it's a sin. I shouldn't be involved in this. I shouldn't be doing this. I know this is wrong, but I'm doing it anyway. There's a, there's a definite line in the sand that we know when we're engaged in particular sins. And we tend to make them the big sins. And yet, pride is, is, is generally very, uh, very difficult to know when we have moved into it. When we have ventured into being prideful. And so we can slide a little bit at a time into a prideful attitude, into uh, a prideful spirit. It is uh, not as obvious as others. And you know what? The other thing is we take pride in our work. We, we, we are proud of our children. We, there are things that we are, or it's okay to, to be proud in. But, but in this respect, proud for your kids should be, should mean I'm, I'm happy with what they're doing. I'm, I'm blessed that, that, that they are successful in their life, that they're good at sports or, or whatever it is that, that makes you proud for your child. But it becomes a sin when we see it this way, when we see it as a direct result of ourselves. I'm proud for my kid because that reflects good on me. That's a prideful spirit. 
I'm proud for what my child is doing because other people think highly of me as a result of that. I'm proud of what my kid has become because I'm the one who, who created and, and made them what they are. Those are the kind of things that lead us into pri- prideful situations that is dangerous. And so it's important that we understand that being proud means that I'm taking credit, that I'm getting the glory, that it is pointing towards me as opposed to just being pleased with, um, with how the situation has turned out. The, the second thing that I think that makes pride, pride so dangerous is this, that in our culture today, pride has been elevated almost to a, a good thing. That we look at, at, at pride as, as something that is a strong aspect of character. The, the Marines say what? The, the few, the proud, the Marines. We, we look at, at our sports heroes today who, are, who, who walk around with arrogance and pride. And, and, and that's, your, your coach might even say, be proud, be proud. You know, you need to be, have, have pride as, a, as an individual. And yet pride is dangerous because it is, it is pointing towards myself. It's taking credit uh, when, when I have no reason to, to take credit. And, and so the final thing, and this is the biggest reason, the most dangerous reason, and that is that pride em- eliminates the need for God. Because pride says, I am, I am where I am because of what I have done. I am who I am because of how hard I've worked. I've got what I've got because I'm so stinking intelligent. I'm so smart. I am everything that I am as a result of everything that I am. And that is, that eliminates the need for God. Because because the truth is, God made me, God created me. God gets the credit for any good that might come out of me. And when I begin to see myself as the reason for my success as the reason for my child's success, as, as the reason for any good that is in my life, then I have eliminated the only true giver of good things, and that, that's God. And so pride is dangerous, most dangerous because of that. We no longer need God when we think, when we believe that we are the reason for all the good in our life. And so, essentially, pride places us in the place of God. We are now in his seat, in his throne. And so we're going to look at how pride had such a disastrous detrimental effect on the life of King Nebuchadnezzar. It was his downfall. It was the the root of all the problems that he is about to endure, that he's about to encounter, was a result of his, his pride. And I think a good way to set up the text for today, we're going to begin in verse 24, but I want to read a verse from last week. And it's Chapter 4 of Daniel, verse 4. And it says this, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. He is at the most dangerous intersection you can be, at the corner of contented and prosperous. He is in, in, a, in a position, in a place where he is ripe and, and for the picking in, in regards to pride. When we are sitting at, at the most contented and, and, and prosperous place is the point when we are most likely to fall into, into pride. And so it's so important that we see this critical link between his contentment and his prosperity and his pride, which is about to become fully seen and, and, and understood. And so it's why elsewhere in Scripture... Uh, Jesus and, and, and other and writers of the, test, of the New Testament speak of the danger of, of wealth, the danger of, of prosperity. Jesus said to the rich young ruler, sell everything you have and follow me. He said, it is easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. It doesn't mean that it's impossible for rich people to enter into heaven, but it means that there is a, a, a great possibility when we are, 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 are possess, possessing stuff of losing focus on the source of our stuff. That it is God that, that gives and, and God that blesses us with everything that we have. And yet, wealth, prosperity removes that, that, uh, that link that, and becomes a, a great distraction 
in our life. So, so Nebuchadnezzar sitting in his palace, contented and prosperous when this hits. And let's look at beginning at verse 24. And, and I, I don't know if I, we got this up on, on your first point there, but we're most prone to the sin of pride during contentment and prosperity. Verse 24 through 25 says this. This is the interpretation, O king. Let's just stop there a second. If you weren't here last week, you remember, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And just like the last time he had a dream, he called on his wise men to come and tell him what that dream meant. And none of the wise men that came through were able to interpret it. But then comes Daniel. In fact, the scripture says, finally, Daniel walks into the room. And Daniel is ready to give him the interpretation. What does this dream mean? And, and, and so, uh, last week we looked at the dream itself, which spoke of a giant tree that was cut down. And now, Daniel begins the interpretation. This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree that the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. So Daniel begins to explain the meaning of the dream. And he says this, that essentially the king is just about to lose his mind. He's just about ready to, to go insane. And that is the, this description of him, of him uh, leaving the, the, the palace and living in the fields as, as a wild animal. And actually there's a, there's a psychological term for that that some of you may be aware of. But I, I don't recall what it is. But, but it is a true uh, uh, actual uh, diagnosis of, the, of, of people who, where they believe that they are a, a wild beast and, and live as such. And that is what is about to happen to, to Nebuchadnezzar. And he even Daniel gives us an explanation here of what the purpose of this event is going to be. Why Nebuchadnezzar is going to undergo this incredible transformation in, in, his, in his life. And he says that until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. He says, you are going to remain in this state, this, this wild animal state, until you recognize that there is a God in heaven who is sovereign over all things on the earth. Why did he need to learn that? Well, he needed to learn that because at this point in his life, he believes that he is sovereign, that he is the one who is over all things, as the king of, of the, what was the, the known world at that time, really. And, and so there was a lesson that, that, that King Nebuchadnezzar needed to learn. And so what he needed to understand was that he was not in charge. That there was someone above him, there was someone beyond him. And so what we see here is that Nebuchadnezzar no longer saw, if he ever saw, that God was working in his life. He saw his life as completely independent of God. Everything that he did, everything that he accomplished was a result of what he had done. And so there was no need for God. There was no recognition that God was even at work in his life. And one of the first things that we need to recognize and understand about pride, and this is in our life as, uh, as well, is that pride results in a failure to recognize God's work in a person's life. When we become prideful, then all of a sudden we don't even see God involved. Because when I accomplish something, I accomplish something. Whatever I have done, I've done because I've worked hard, because I'm good, because I'm talented. And, and all of a sudden, I don't see that God is intimately involved in my life. Pride, pride leads us in that direction. It, it leads us to believe that the accomplishments of our life are all a product of our own talents, our own abilities, our own, our own skills. And then verse 26 and 27 says, The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Now you remember in the dream, the tree is cut down and, and the fruit is removed, the branches are cut off, 
And then the angel said this. He said, but put a, a band of bronze around that stump. And what he was saying essentially was protect the stump. Do not let anything happen to the stump because in that stump is life. It is, it is not, we are not destroying the tree. We are cutting the tree down, but restoring, protecting the life. And what Daniel says is that means this. It says, he says, therefore, the, king, the command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. There's good news here. In fact, there's two aspects of good news here. The first is, is that this isn't forever. That this, what is about to ha- happen to you, this, this period of insanity, which appears to be seven years, it's, some people debate that, but there's this period of seven times, which appears to be seven years, but it is not permanent, that eventually your kingdom will be restored, that, that root remained because your kingdom is going to, to come back. And so eventually you are going to understand, Nebuchadnezzar, that God is sovereign, that God is in control. So that was the first part of the good news. The second part of the good news was this. He even presents the opportunity of avoiding this disaster in his life. Look what he says to him there. We look again at at verse uh, 28. He says, or 27, Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice, Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that in then your prosperity will continue. He is saying that, look, you got a chance here. You have an opportunity to turn around, to repent, to do what is right, to understand that God is in control, that God is sovereign and that you are not. And if you, in fact, understand that and, and, and embrace that and do that, that this does not have to happen. Now why is that? Why does, does God grant this second chance for him? Well, I, I believe it is because God's action against the king was tamper, or tempered with his grace and his mercy. God does not ever act in, in, towards you, towards the king, towards anyone, with discipline simply because God gets some pleasure out of being mean to people. That he somehow gets some kind of joy out of beating us down, being angry at us. God's discipline always seeks repentance. God's discipline is always aimed at turning us in another direction. And so for the king, he has been given an opportunity to embrace God's grace and his mercy and and to turn from the direction that he has been been headed to. James chapter 4 verse 16 says this but he gives us more grace that is why scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble God's grace and mercy is is always available and always present and even Nebuchadnezzar this king who deserved great punishment God is presenting grace and mercy giving him an opportunity to, to repent and one last, I think, important note about it in this passage. Look at how Daniel describes Nebuchadnezzar's sin. In verse 27 again, he says this, he says, Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. Now, think about this. As we've looked at this passage and we've looked at the, the problems that Nebuchadnezzar has, all of them have to do with pride. He's talking about his prideful spirit, his prideful, his arrogance and and this pride that that God keeps bringing up in this passage. And then when Daniel, from his perspective, when he describes it, he says, you need to be kind to the oppressed. Why is that? Well, I think that is because, because pride and arrogance, pride will be displayed to other people by a devaluing of other people's lives. You, in pride, as you exalt yourself, other people become less important and less valued. And so from Daniel's perspective, as he watched this king 
Pride was evident to him in the way that the king treated other people. He treated the oppressed. He oppressed them. He treated them in, in, a, in, a, in a devalued manner. And pride always does that. Pride will always cause us to view other people as lesser than ourselves. And if we begin to view people in that way, that should be an indication that, that pride is becoming present in our life. That somehow somebody else's life is not as, as valuable as mine. That somebody else's opinion is not as, as important as mine. Those are, are elements of, of pride. And then verse 28 through 30 says this, All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Notice who Nebuchadnezzar believes is responsible for the great kingdom of Babylon. It's him. It's all about him. Look what I have done. Look at my kingdom. In fact, a kingdom that has been built for my glory. He sees everything that has been accomplished as a result of his own life and, 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 and his, all the, the good things that he has done is because he is a great and mighty king. The sin of pride is always rooted in an exalted view of oneself. Pride will always lift up ourselves. It will always put us on the center stage. It will always value our opinion. It will always value everything of myself over somebody else. And that was present with Nebuchadnezzar. The man by the name of Edward Payson said this, that I think so succinctly summarizes what, what is spoken of here. He says, Pride consists in an unduly exalted opinion of oneself. It is therefore impatient of a rival, hates a superior, and cannot endure a master. And it is why pride is so dangerous. Because it will not tolerate someone telling that w what to do. And so it cannot endure God. It cannot live in co in, in, together with God. Because, because there is not room for God. Pride minimizes the efforts of others and focuses on our own contribution. In fact, if it weren't for my contribution, this would fail. That is a, 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 a prideful uh, statement. And you know, as a church, we can look at these kind of things and we can try to apply them to all the prideful and arrogant people that we know in the world. We can pick out political leaders and sports heroes and and all these people and say, yeah, that pride's evident in that person's life. But the truth is that even as Christians, as a church, we have to be so, so cautious and careful in regards to pride. It is very easy as a church to become prideful. It is very easy to look around and say, we've got two services. We've got two services. The church is full. And, and that becomes a source of pride. It becomes a, what I have done, what we have done, the programs that we have put together, our awesome snow camp, our, our, uh, our, our tremendous worship team, and, and, and it becomes all about us. And that leads to a, a, a prideful attitude. And, and the scripture says, pride comes before a fall. When we as believers, as a church, begin to believe in ourselves in that way, then we are in dangerous territory. And I believe that if you look at all the occasions of, of church, church division and, 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 uh, and uh, fallen leaders and, and all those examples, I think every one of them, they might have different sins, they might have different circumstances, but I believe that every one of them leads back to pride. Because there, gets to, there comes a point where as, as a church, as a leader, you, you begin to believe you begin to believe your own press clippings. You begin to believe that this is a result of what I've done as, a, as opposed to what God has done. And so we don't even believe that the rules apply to us anymore. We're above that. And that was where Nebuchadnezzar found himself. And, and it's where we can, we can um, begin to, to, to believe that ourselves. And, and we are in a, a difficult and dangerous place. And notice... 
not only is he taking credit for what has been accomplished at Babylon, he also, it is for what purpose? For his glory. Not only does he want to, to uh, believe in his head that this has all been done by me, but he also wants some credit for that. It's for my glory. I've done this so you will notice me and I will get the credit for it. And it is a, a, a common uh, element in, in, in when people fall into, um, into pride. It's not, just, it's not just about me and what I believe to be true. It's important that you know and believe that same thing. That I get the credit. That I get the pat on the back. That I get the, my picture in the paper. That I get the credit and the glory for whatever it is that's been accomplished the sin of pride always seeks self-glorification. It always seeks to get the credit, to get the, 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 uh, the pat on the back as a result of what has been done. Verse 31. The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from the people and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. The words were just falling off his lips. And God strikes this judgment from, from heaven. Immediately, What had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew, excuse me, like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. And so there's this description of as he falls into this beast state. And if you want to see an interesting, there's kind of a famous painting that was done years ago of Nebuchadnezzar in this state. Just go Google uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, beast or something like that. And there's this picture of of an artist's conception of what Nebuchadnezzar looked like as he was roaming the pasture land uh, with, with, with other beasts and other wild animals. And, and so we see this moment where as a result of his pride, he is moving from the palace to the pasture. He is losing that seat of authority that he never truly had any way that he thought he did. And he is going to be humbled in a way that we cannot fathom. We can't even imagine what it would be like. And and you see... What God is saying to the king is this. He says, when you understand who is in control, when you understand who truly is sovereign, who is actually the one who calls the shots, then you can have your kingdom back, but, but not until then. And, and I think it's really interesting here, if you look at this, at this passage, that as, as we move through this, it is, begins in the first person. Nebuchadnezzar is speaking telling the story himself. And then we get to that point of his insanity where it is no longer in the first person. Someone else is telling the story. And then at the moment his sanity is restored, it returns to the first person, him telling the story, which probably means that there is that point in his life, those seven years in the field where he doesn't remember a thing, where he doesn't even, isn't even able to recall the story. And yet, that moment that his sanity is restored, he begins telling the story in the the third person again. We're about to see what brings victory over pride. We we looked here at some of the aspects of pride, the elements of pride, the dangers of pride. Now we're going to look at what brings victory over pride. And this is important because we are prone to pride. We tend to, to fall in that direction. And so it is critical that we understand how how we win victory over that. I mean, I would challenge every one of you that that you might be the most humble person that you know. And if you believe that, then you're probably not. 
but you might be the most humble person that there is on this earth, and yet there are elements of pride in your life. And so it is important that we see how pride is, is, is uh, combated against here. And notice when it happens. When is it that he restore, is restored to sanity? It is when he lifts his eyes to heaven. Now, I don't know if that means that it was that moment that he looked to heaven that caused things to change, or if it was the seven years was up and it was time to look to heaven and, and that his sanity be restored. But I think there is a great truth in that for us. And that is that pride, we begin the victory over pride when we take our eyes off of ourselves and we place our eyes on God. When we, we remove all our vision and our thoughts from ourselves and begin to see as God sees. And for Nebuchadnezzar, it was at that moment when he looked to heaven that God gave him his sanity back. He restored his, his, his mind at that moment. Victory over pride begins when we take our eyes off ourselves and place them on God. And in your life, if you find yourself living with pieces of pride, you find yourself being just a little arrogant and prideful about things in your life, I would say this, take your eyes off of yourself, put your eyes on God. Now, how do you do that? Well, you do that by spending time in, in God's Word, by reading the Bible and, and getting an understanding of God's perspective of us. But, but the, the beginning of this victory is removing your eyes from yourself. Quit seeing everything from your perspective and, and seeing things from God's perspective. And let's see how this continues. Actually beginning partway through verse 34 there. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? As we read this closing praise from the king, it really seems so, so evident to me that something really is different. Something truly has changed. If we look at the first three verses of chapter 4 and the last uh, five or six verses of, of chapter 4, which, which is kind of bookends to the narrative, the story that he tells, it, it is completely different than the words of Nebuchadnezzar elsewhere in Scripture. He is, he is singing the praises of God. He is not speaking of God who is superior to the Babylonian gods. He's not speaking of Daniel's God or the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's talking about the God, the one and only true God. And so I believe, and, and I don't, can't be absolutely certain about that, but I, I believe that Nebuchadnezzar has come to know the real and the true God. I, I, this, is the, this is where his life ends in, in, as far as is recorded in Daniel chapter 4. We don't hear from him any, anymore after that. There's a new king when we get to Daniel chapter 5. But it seems that something is so changed in his life as, as a result of, of this this. This, this story and, and what has happened to him. He no longer seeks his own glory, but now he is giving the credit to God. He is pointing what has happened towards God and not himself. Victory over pride continues when we give credit to God. Then we deflect the praise that comes to us, to the God who created us. That brings victory over pride. And I'm not talking about some kind of false kind of false humility where, where everything is glory to God, you know, with all the credit to God. God. Uh, I mean, I think there, we can walk, a, we can step too far in that direction. But, but it is recognizing that everything in our life is God is the source. God is the one who accomplishes anything that we might hope to accomplish. And so whatever you do, whatever it is that you do, whether you are a student, whether you are a, uh, whether you are a teacher, a nurse, uh, a doctor, a, a counselor, whatever it is you do, you do it to the absolute best of your ability. You do it for the glory of God. 
You should be the best at whatever it is you should you do. You should be the best understanding that everything that you do is purely, simply from the hand of God and that God deserves the credit for whatever it is that you might accomplish, whatever you do. In verse 36, it says, At that same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, Praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven because everything He does is right and all His ways are just and those who walk in pride He is able to humble. Nebuchadnezzar had spent the first 65 years of his life or more pointing towards what he had done. Looking back and reflecting on his glory and his greatness and now as he is near the end of his life he, he recognizes that the source of everything that he has ever accomplished is, is God himself. And he even recognizes that it was his pride that, that was in the way. That it was his pride that, that brought him down. He finally sees that the plan that God had for him was superior to any plan that he might have. I want you to think about this from Nebuchadnezzar's perspective. If he were to look back on his life, and he were to look at the, the high points and the low points of his life, it would be tough to look at seven years of grazing in the pasture land as a, a good time in my life, a positive time, a time I enjoyed, a time I relish. And yet, it was probably the greatest blessing that he ever had in his life. Because it humbled him. It helped him to see that there was a God in heaven who had a, a perfect and wonderful plan, even if that plan meant wandering in the fields, grazing on grass. Even if that was part of the plan, that was better than any plan that Nebuchadnezzar could have. And so, we win victory over pride when we realize, when we recognize that God's plan is better than our own. That any plan that you might be able to put together, any plan you might be able to hatch, and you might think it's the greatest plan, the most explicit and well-planned plan, and, but that God's plan is superior to that. And, and, and sometimes, in order to understand that, in order to see that, we have to be humbled. Nebuchadnezzar was humbled in a way that I, I can't comprehend, that I can't imagine. And yet it was the, the, the greatest event in his life because it brought him to the point where he saw his need for God, where he saw that God's plan is, is involved, God's plan is perfect, God's plan is accomplishing what God desires for it to accomplish. You know, God knows what's best for you. He, he has a plan that is perfect for every one of you. And, and, and if what is required for you and for me to embrace that plan, if what is required is being humbled, then we should pray to be humbled. We should pray that God gets a hold of us and helps us to see that the reality is that there is only one God, and it's not me. It is the God in heaven. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you today for this time together. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for the great truth that we see in in Nebuchadnezzar's life, changed, Lord, by this, this great event of humility, of, of driven to the fields, to, to a, a point below anything we can comprehend or imagine. And yet, Lord, it brought him to see the one true king. Lord, I pray for us. I pray for us as a church, Lord, that you would humble us, that you would help us to see, God, that anything we hope to accomplish, either as individuals or as a body of believers, God, it, it, it rests on you, not us. Lord, that, that we would understand that there is one king, there is one sovereign ruler who has a plan that is perfect for each and every one of us. And, and Father, that is you. As we close today, Lord, whatever is needed in our life to understand that and to see that, we pray for that. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's stand. A closing song here today entitled Who Am I? And, and one of the great keys to understanding, to, to ridding ourselves of pride is, is understanding who we are in relation to who God is. We, as we sing, who am I? You need to truly ask yourself that question. Who are you in relation to the, the God who made this earth? Who are you in, in, in relation to the, the person that holds your life in, your hand, in his hands? And, and as we understand that, as we have a, a grasp, a, a, an understanding of that truth, I, we, I think, begin to be humbled. Begin, begin to, to see God for who He is.
Father God, we thank you today. Thank you, Lord, for the, the great message that comes from the words of Daniel. Thank you, God, for this great reminder to us, Lord, on, on pride. And God, what a, what a beautiful conclusion there, that it is not who we are, but it's what you've done. It's not what we've done, but it's who you are. Lord, that that would be a, a reminder that would remain on our lips as we leave here today, God, that, that it is about you. It's not about us. That the glory that we, that we accomplish, Lord, goes to you. The things that we do, Lord, are all for you. Help us, Lord, to live that way, that we would point people to, to the great God, the sovereign king of this universe. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray these things all. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you.